Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we're going to be in the Psalms. Now, we're actually going to be covering the Psalms for three different lessons in Come, Follow Me. So this section is going to be Psalms 1 through 46. Now, this week is covering Psalm 1 and 2, and then the 8th Psalm, and then it skips all the way to 19. It goes 19 to 33, and then 40 and 46. Now, Psalms are an interesting book of Scripture. This is kind of like going from the Book of Mormon to the Doctrine and Covenants. We've been doing mostly historical books, and so there's a storyline. So you're connecting the story of the Scriptures to the story of your life, and that's kind of a fun connection. And then sometimes you get into the Doctrine and Covenants where there really isn't that storyline, and we, well, what do I do with these? And that's how you're going to feel as you read the Psalms here is you're going to feel like this is different. This is unfamiliar territory because it's like we're singing songs or we're reading poems or we're walking down a museum looking at beautiful art. And so it's a little bit different, but hang on. There's some beautiful reasons to study the Psalms, right, Mike? Absolutely. But where did they come from? That's a great question. We think that many of the Psalms were written during the time of the monarchy, Now, when I say during the time of the monarchy, I'm talking about the unified monarchy, David and Solomon. Now, some of the Psalms give evidence that they were written after the exile. For example, the 137th Psalm, the author tells you that this is after the temple's been destroyed. But I I think it's safe for us to assert that the Psalms were produced by many different poets over more than half a millennium probably beginning during or even before the 10th century BC, even though we don't really have the precise dating of them. I mean, the Psalms don't come with dates, but many of them were probably from what's called the first temple period, from about 1000 BC to the destruction of the temple. And many of them were used, we think, as part of the temple service. Big picture, the Psalms are praises to God. And the Psalms were songs. Now, that word for song, that Hebrew word, mizmor, is something sung, but the collection of the Psalms isn't called mizmorim or Psalms, but it's actually called praises. And so most of the Psalms kind of fall into these categories. And sometimes a Psalm can fit into more than one of these, but a lot of times a a Psalm would be a hymn of praise, praising God, or a Psalm could be a complaint or a plea to God for help. Sometimes those are called the laments. And then there's other psalms that are called thanksgiving psalms. Now, there's subcategories. I mean, we could get really detailed here, you know, wisdom psalms and royal psalms and Zion psalms and some of those things. Um, We have a list in the show notes where we kind of break down some of the more lengthy psalms. For example, there's a bunch of psalms that deal with the battle against chaos in creation, as God battled chaos. And then there are a whole series of enthronement psalms. And so as we go through the psalms, especially some of the longer ones, we'll try and put those in categories so that you can kind of see how they could fit. But the purpose of them probably fit for many reasons. For example, we think that some of the psalms could have been a prayer that a person could give when they came to the temple, a plea or a cry out for help. Some of them were used in the temple, we, we think, according to many scholars. Uh, some of them could have been used in a, in a local setting where you worship God. And so big picture, they're praises. So years ago, there were a couple of scholars by the name of Hermann Gunkel and Sigmund Mowinkel, and we cite a lot of their stuff in the show notes. I, I got to say, these are not Latter-day Saint scholars, but what they did is they, they did some heavy digging to try and figure out what was the setting in life of the Psalms. And... Sigmund Mowinkel asserts that a setting for a large number of the Psalms is the religious activity at the temple in ancient Israel, what we're going to call the first Israelite temple. Now, the Book of Mormon is coming out of first Israelite temple religion. And so the Book of Mormon is an ancient document that is affirming truths that were lost. And the Psalms, many of them have this old religion 
but it's kind of been scrambled. A really good explanation is imagine you have 150 highly detailed puzzle pieces, but you don't know what the picture is on the box because you don't have the box. But what you have are puzzle pieces, but they're not flat. They're three-dimensional, and you don't know which way to turn them to make the picture fit, but you know that you have them, and you know they make a picture. That's kind of like what the Psalms are. There's 150 of them, and they're rich. They're not flat. They're kind of like three-dimensional objects. But I always like to teach that the message of the Book of Mormon is the picture. And so if we take the Book of Mormon and we hold it over the Psalms as kind of like a big magnifying glass, imagine you have this really big magnifier with a light on it, and you put it over the puzzle pieces, and then imagine you have someone who's been to the temple pointing out where to put pieces. And as you're doing it, you start to assemble the big picture of how many of the Psalms were used. And so as Sigmund Mowinkle went through this and not being of our faith, having not been through the temple, he's doing his best to construct this using the tools at his disposal, which is scholarship and languages and looking at how other cultures did their temple experience. You see, for example, all the ancient cultures had a New Year festival and they would celebrate the sovereignty of God. They would talk about God's creation. They would talk about God dealing and battling against chaos to create things. I mean, we see this even in the Greek stuff, if you've ever read Hesiod, where he talks about the chaos that caused creation. But we see this in Mesopotamian religion. We see this in Canaanite religion. We see this in Egyptian texts, that there was this chaos, and then out of it came creation. And after creation came man. And what's the purpose of life? And I mean, if you've been through the Latter-day Saint temple, you kind of know what we're talking about. And then through this, anciently, they would talk about psalms of anticipation of the coming of God, God's ability to work with men and women through covenants, through instruction. And then over the course of this experience, this took place in what scholars call the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the New Year's celebratory rite that people would come to the temple over a period of days, and they would make covenants with God. And the way they would do this is they would be taught and they would be instructed. They'd have a temple drama, and then the king and queen would represent the people to God, but then they would also represent God to the people. And so it's like this conduit of power. So for example, the people would be at the temple and the king and queen would be at the altar and make covenants before a priest, which would represent God. And then they would stand and represent God to the people. And as they made covenants, if they kept them, the people would be blessed, especially if then the people would keep the covenant. And so they would keep it. They would promise to keep it. The king and queen would promise to keep it. And in doing this every year, They would ensure the fertility of the land. And during the course of the temple drama, in some of the cultures, the king, this didn't really happen, but the king would be ritually slain. If you've ever been to a play where someone's killed, they're not really killed, but you see it on the play. And then there would be dirges and laments. And a bunch of Psalms have this, where the king is surrounded by his enemies. We're going to read some of them today. And then at the conclusion of the death of the king, then he would be brought back to life. He would be resurrected. And so we have some of these called enthronement Psalms, where he's redeemed and he's enthroned and he'd be washed and anointed and he'd be clothed. And then he would have his feet established on the rock of the Holy of Holies. And as the king and queen had their feet established, there would be peace This, in essence, was the New Year Festival, the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is the way that uh, Mo Winkle and other scholars looked at the, the Psalms, and they said, oh my goodness, there's all these Psalms that are doing this. Other cultures are doing this. This is probably what was happening in ancient Israel. And then later, we have a group of Latter-day Saint scholars, and they wrote a great book, and it's called Who Shall Ascend into the Hill of the Lord? The Psalms in Israel's Temple Worship in the Old Testament and in the Book of Mormon. Phenomenal book. Yeah. So scholars that are not of our faith have come to the conclusion that the Psalms were written in a temple ceremony setting. And now we have Latter-day Saint scholars who have the lens of the Book of Mormon, and they have the modern-day endowment, and they're saying, wait a minute, we could put these back in order. The order has been scrambled. What we find in the book of Psalms, Psalm 1 through 150, has been scrambled, and we can put them back in order so that it lays out very similar to our modern-day endowment. Yeah. 
I would say that the endowment is kind of an abbreviated version of this multiple day, day ceremony. Yeah, they, anciently, they did it was days. a multiple day event. Right. And so when we individually go to the temple to be endowed, it's an individual journey. It's not a ceremony that the whole people would participate in like they did anciently. Yeah. Now, the Grand Baker and Stephen Ricks' book, it's very in-depth. It's over 700 pages long. Maybe you don't have the time or you're not necessarily going to take the time right now to read over 700 pages. So we did do a short document called Overview of the First Israelite Temple Drama, and we link this in the show notes so you can kind of see you know, briefly what's happening. And we try to put some of the Psalms in order. For example, in the multiple day experience, the Israelites would go to the temple and it would start with the Council of the Gods. And that's really Psalm 82. I mean, Psalm 82 is the front end of what's going on in the Psalms. And Latter-day Saints often refer to that as premortal existence. Exactly. Yeah, thank you for making that clear. And then it would get into the creation Psalms, and then it would get into Psalms that talk about Yahweh beating the chaos as part of the creation experience. And then He shall go... have power to bruise thy head, but thou shalt have power to crush him. Yes. Starting to sound familiar? Right. It's that same theme. And now if you just apply your lens of the temple, the Book of Mormon's lens as it lays out the plan of salvation, you can really find some incredible connections as we study these Psalms. They're like puzzle pieces that you can begin to put into place. Personally, for me, it's exciting to pick up a psalm, and to me, they just have like a neon sign attached to them that's flashing that's saying, do you see it? For example, Psalm 22, to me, is all about Jesus, even though it never says Jesus Christ in the psalm. But you're going to recognize a lot of the phrases from it. Right. It's all there. And so Baker and Rick's assertion is that the early Israelites knew that their God would come down and perform the atonement. We know this from the Book of Mormon, where Book of Mormon authors, for example, Jacob says, all the prophets have testified of Christ. And then we have Nephi, where he says many plain and precious things were removed from the scriptures. I think in part what Nephi is talking about, as far as the plain and precious things taken out, was Jesus out of his Bible, the Bible that Nephi had. Many things were edited out of the Bible, and I think it frustrated Nephi, and he wanted to put Jesus back into the narrative. And so I believe that Nephi's standing between these two great realms of religious history. He's standing at the end of what's called the first Israelite temple, and he sees the apostasy happening in the second temple period. And so the Book of Mormon has been untouched by the apostates that have changed the religion of the time period of Nephi and the Second Temple period. The Book of Mormon is bringing us the old religion, and many of the things in the Psalms survived those editing processes. And I think one of the reasons why they survived, I think that the editors didn't know what they were looking at in many cases. And and it's hard to edit something if you don't quite understand it. So a lot of the Psalms were probably mixed together. In fact, the question that people often ask is, when were they assembled? We're pretty sure they were assembled no later than the 4th century BC. Most scholars agree that the Psalms, as they are now constituted, were assembled during the Second Temple period, which makes perfect sense, because as they lose some of their beliefs about uh, God, at least as as we as Latter-day Saints understand it, they put the Psalms in different order. And if you want to know more about this, go to the show notes. Now, let me jump to how do I read them? What purpose do they serve in my life? And I think this is a prism of many, many colors. And so one of those is read the Psalms because they express what your soul is trying to sing. If I strike a tuning fork that's set to a certain wavelength and bring it in close proximity to one that's set to that same wavelength, it will start the other one vibrating. That's kind of how tuning forks work. Well, sometimes truth works that same way. Is deep within us is a core belief. There's something way down inside my soul. And then when I read a poem or I see a picture or I sing a song that just resonates with something deep in my soul, it's just like a truth written in a very simple sentence that I feel in the depths of my soul. And I hold on to that truth, especially in darkness, especially when I need hope. And the phrases kind of stand alone. They don't need background. They don't need understanding. Phrases like, be still and know that I am God. 
So Mike and I are going to do that over these next couple of weeks. We're just going to point out some of the phrases that resonate with us. And so that's one thing that the Psalms do. And we're also going to kind of present, do you see where this chapter or that phrase fits in the temple endowment or in the overall picture of the restoration or in the plan of salvation? Yeah, Bryce and I had to make a decision. Are we going to go sequentially through the Psalms or are we going to just go as we think they were ordered? And I think we're going to go sequentially. We're going to start in one and we're going to end in 46. So if all of a sudden we're in the enthronement psalm and the very next one is way back in pre-mortal life, you can see that there's been a scramble here. Yeah. So let's jump into Psalm 1. And I love Psalm 1 because once again, it puts the tree back into the temple, which if you remember our discussion about King Josiah's reforms, there's a suggestion that he removed the tree out of the Holy of Holies. But the very beginning of the Book of Mormon, we're right back talking about a tree and the influence of that tree. And then John in the Revelation puts that tree right back in the Holy of Holies. And I love that we begin the first psalm with, blessed are those who walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. It kind of sounds like heeding not the people in the building, right? Does that ring a bell? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And if you heed them not, it shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in the season, his leaf shall not wither. Now, all of a sudden, you think of all those phrases about whosoever drink of this water shall not thirst. And what Alma says about the fruit of the tree of life, he says, you shall pluck the fruit thereof, which is most precious, which is sweet above all that is sweet, which is white above all that is white, which is pure above all that is pure, and you shall feast upon this fruit even until you are filled, that ye hunger not neither shall ye thirst. Now, that's how we begin the Psalms. And that's how the Book of Mormon begins. We're right back to the tree and being fed from that tree and not thirsting anymore. But the danger is in that very first verse. If you give heed to the people around you, and that causes you to stop eating the fruit, you're going to miss those blessings. So I love the opening of the psalm and that reference to the Book of Mormon and the tree. For you language nerds, there's a fun pun there with tree and council. We're punning on the same idea. So the idea is you come into God's council, you come to the tree. That's really good. Let's get into the second psalm. This is what we're going to call an enthronement psalm, because in All the ceremonies and ordinances of the festal drama, the king represented each person in the audience as though the play were only about that one person. That would also be true here. Because Psalm 2 represents a similar ordinance where each person in the audience had just been made a sacral king, a more meaningful reading of those last verses would be that the kings addressed here were men in the congregation who were newly created sacral kings. Now, that's Baker and Ricks. Uh, What they're asserting is that verse 6 is applying to those who are making and keeping covenants. So if you go to Psalm 2 and you look in verse 6, it says, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. If you're upon the holy hill of Zion, you're in Jerusalem. And if you're upon the holy hill, you're at the temple. That's what the holy hill is. So I've set my king there. And then look what verse 7 says. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, thou art my son. This day I have begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. So he's clearly talking about Jesus and the victory over death, but you and I understand that we can receive the same promise that Jesus received. That when God says to Jesus, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased— Someday, because of the atonement of Christ, he's going to say the same thing to each one of us. Thou art my beloved son. Thou art my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. It all has to do with Christ's victory and our covenants to follow Christ to our victory. Now, we can also add the experience with King Benjamin in chapters 1 through 6 of Mosiah. And Baker and Ricks assert this, but so do many other Latter-day Saint scholars, that 
the sermon that King Benjamin gives in Mosiah 1 through 6 is this New Year's ceremony. It's the Feast of Tabernacles, and he's doing the same things that we think are happening at the Feast of Tabernacles in ancient Israel. And we have a similar promise. If you go to chapter 5, verse 7, when the saints make the covenant that they will obey God, verse 7 says, Because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he has spiritually begotten you. Now notice how that reads a little bit different from the psalm. In the psalm it says, verse 7 of chapter 2, Thou art my son. I like how the Book of Mormon includes both genders, sons and daughters, because there were women in the audience. Women were part of this, and they were making covenants. And this is where I think the Book of Mormon's brilliance shines through. It shines a light on this psalm and says, the setting is the temple. In this instance, the king is being re-enthroned. The people at a new year right are making covenants to obey God, and in so doing, they are set upon the holy hill of Zion. And there isn't a single blessing that anyone in the audience couldn't receive that the king and the queen did receive. They were all, by covenant, kings and queens themselves. Yeah. A second important bit of Psalm 2 is verse 8 and 9, and that is something that we'll refer to often as the promise of invulnerability. There are many times when those that make the covenant are given special promises that they will be invulnerable to the dangers of the adversary. One biblical scholar, Margaret Barker, said, speaking of these promises, quote, The rituals of the Holy of Holies were thus taking place outside of time and matter, in the realm of the angels and the heavenly throne. And those who functioned in the Holy of Holies were more than human, being and seeing beyond time. We see promises like this in the Book of Mormon as well. This promise of invulnerability is given in the Book of Mormon and even in the latter days. You see it often. Even in the sacrament prayer, it says that if we keep his commandments, we may always have his spirit to be with us. And then in the Doctrine and Covenants at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, it reiterated that same promise. Now, this is both literal and symbolic, and so we, we need to be careful that we don't apply this into every possible situation, but this is the promise of the faithful. Section 109, starting in verse 25 and 26, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper, that he who diggeth a pit for them shall fall into the same himself, that no combination of wickedness shall have power to rise up and prevail over thy people upon whom thy name shall be put in this house. Now, they did get kicked out of Jackson County. And they did get kicked out of Nauvoo, kind of. And so we need to be careful that we don't apply that promise to every circumstance in all of our individual lives, because part of mortality, as we are going to see in these Psalms, is to be tested and tried and to respond to those situations. But God will be with his people. And in the end, we will be victorious over evil, and he will wipe away all tears from off our eyes. I like that, Bryce. In the end, I think that's the key. And I think that's what Margaret Barker is talking about. We're talking about things outside of time. So when you read Psalm 2, 8 and 9, where it says, I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. I think modern readers might read this and say, well, that doesn't sound very nice. And in essence, remember these sacred kings or these sacral kings that made the covenant represent Israel. And a lot of this ties into modern temples today. But really, It's all about Jesus. Jesus has been set upon the holy hill. He is the son, and he is the one that shall dash them to pieces. And so we kind of got to look at this cosmically. But that's big picture stuff on Psalm 2. It's an enthronement psalm. And the enthronement of the king was at the end of the festal drama. So here we have Psalm 2 at the beginning of the psalms with an event that would have happened at the end. So I think this really illustrates how this is kind of mixed up. Yeah. Let's jump to Psalm 8, because the psalm asks an intriguing question. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Out of all the creations, and God has created so many incredible things, worlds without number and majestic mountains and lakes and animals, and God's creations are so vast and so glorious. Why is it that man gets so much of his attention? Why is man so central in all of his creation. And that's the whole purpose of this endowment. That's the whole purpose of this ceremony, because man 
has the potential to be what God is. This is Psalm 8, starting in verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Now, putting man in this whole temple drama is critical because we can get carried away and see the king, and we can see the redeemer, and we can see all these major players. But the whole point of the temple drama is to elevate each and every man and woman to king and queen status. And that's amazing if you think about it, because no one rebels against God more than man. No one fights God more than man does. In the Book of Mormon, we find these wonderful verses like, we're less than the dust of the earth because the dust always obeys God. Mountains always obey God. Planets always obey God, but God's children don't. And yet it's God's children that are the very center of this whole drama. They are the reason for the drama, to make them what he is. In this whole drama, who's the main character? Now, I know we have the Savior and we have the King and all of those, but in one sense, we could say that the main character is each child of God. And everything that he is doing to bring that individual person into his presence and to make them what he is. That's the whole reason for the drama. You know, Bryce, many LDS scholars have talked about how the temple helps us get our bearings. Part of the endowment is to get us into a space where we can see where we fit into things. And we are sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And it's interesting here that Psalm 8 is all about creation, right? How excellent is the name of the earth who has set the glory about the heavens. When I consider the heavens, verse 3, the work of thy fingers, we're talking about creation, but then we say, what is man? What's interesting is verse 5 is just as you've talked about, man is a little lower than the angels. The original Hebrew text is that man is a little lower than not the Malachim, but the Elohim. It's literally the gods. And then the Greek translators in about the third, fourth century, they change Elohim to the Greek word agalus which is angels, which we get angels today. And so the King James translators, when they looked at the text, they had the Masoretic text in front of them and they had the Septuagint and they had to pick because they they have to pick one of those. One says that man is a little lower than the gods and another one says a little lower than the angels. And I think the translators had to pick something that fit their theological expectations. And so I like the, the nuance here. I think both work. I think the Elohim could be the divine individuals in the council of the gods, like we've talked about earlier. Psalm 82 was probably at the front end. And this text right here, Psalm 8, is another one of those in the front. And so, Bryce, I really think this even adds to what you're talking about. We're talking about man, but what else are we talking about in verse 5? The gods. I mean, we have the Father, we have the Son, we have Heavenly Mother, we have divine beings, and we'll talk about this in a few weeks, how they counsel together to create the earth. But right here, we're talking about man. And of all the things created, sheep, oxen, fish, and fowl, the greatest creation is man. And that that really harkens us back to Genesis. It also is a plea that we treat man the way we should treat man. And I'm always reminded of that wonderful statement from C.S. Lewis. It may be possible for each to think too much of his own potential glory hereafter. It is hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. The load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid on my back, a load so heavy that only humility can carry it, and the backs of the proud will be broken. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. It is in light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the same awe and circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, art, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals with whom we joke, work, marry, snub, and exploit. And so I think another twist on what we're saying here, especially if you're familiar with temple endowments and the potential of man, I think it's saying 
why do you treat some of Heavenly Father's creations differently than you treat His greatest creation? And I think that needs to stay in our heart as we deal with each other. You know, back to King Benjamin Bryce, he talks about that. How we treat others really matters, even the beggar. Even the beggar. Okay, let's go to Psalm 19. 19 is a wonderful reference to what goes on inside temples. Notice he uses the word tabernacle. And then he uses this phrase over and over again, the law of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord. And I think we're getting synonyms for why we have temples and tabernacles. And here in the setting of a temple, you can begin to see the reason why we have them is so that we can be perfected and convert our soul and that we can make wise what is simple. And so I love the, just that list of in the tabernacle, he has set a tabernacle for the son. It's a bridegroom's chamber. And then he refers to law of the Lord and statutes and commandments, which you and I know have integral parts inside the temple. Yeah. Now, There's stuff in 19 that I really like. I mean, I really like the idea that God's word and his judgments and so forth are, verse 10, more to be desired than gold. And then I love this phrase, sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. And that kind of reminds us of the most sweet, most white fruit from the tree. And ritually, where's the tree? It's in the Holy of Holies. So I think there is some really interesting images that do have to go with the temple here. I think verse 5, we're going to hold off on verse 5, but just know this idea of the bridegroom coming out of the chamber, we're going to see this again in Joel. We see this big picture in the ceremony of the Feast of Tabernacles, or at least in the New Year's ceremony of some of Israel's neighbors. Many of Israel's neighbors as part of the New Year's ceremony, would watch the king and queen get ritually married again because the marriage of the king and queen represented the unification of heaven and earth to ensure fertility. And so there's some of that happening here, I think. At least it could be argued that that that, that could be happening. But that's not the main thing. I think the main thing in 19 is about the law of the Lord and its perfection and how it is, quote, sweeter than honey and honeycomb. Now. Psalm 20 is, like many of the Psalms, a plea for help. What I love about Psalm 20 is Mike and I have talked about increased divine attention in temples. That's what you read in Psalm 20, is that the Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. That when we take our problems into the temple, when we covenant with God at his altar, there is increased divine attention. So we jump right into it and say, the Lord hear thee in the day of trouble— And verse 2, send thee help from the sanctuary. So again, we're coming back to that idea that inside holy temples today, when we take our problems into the temple, we partner with God and we receive increased divine attention. So I love verse 6. I know that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some people trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They, some other people, are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand uprightly. If you partner with God in his temple, he has covenanted to hear and help. And you remember that he said to King Jehoshaphat, the battle is not yours, but God's. So that's really good. Yeah. Psalm 21 is the blessing that is requested is given. We think this was part of the concluding ceremonies of the festival drama. You can know that by its words. It was spoken about one who'd been dressed in sacred robes, had asked for the blessings of eternal life, and had requested that he be accepted into Jehovah's presence. So if you look at this, there's some interesting things happening here in the King James. And I'm just going to say this. I think verse 3 is an awful translation. Verse 3 says, For thou preventest him with the blessings of goodness, thou settest a crown of pure gold upon his head. If you look in the footnote, of verse 3 of, of Psalm 21, it says in Hebrew that thou wilt meet him. That's actually what the text is saying. So I'm going to give another translation to verse 3 that may be helpful. This is by Robert Alter. For you met him with blessings of bounty. You set on his head a crown of pure gold. Another way to read this is, 
For you have come before him with good blessings, and you will set upon his head a crown of pure gold. Now notice, he's being clothed. The king is, verse 5, great in thy salvation, honor and majesty hast thou laid upon him. Or in other words, the king has been clothed. And it says, for thou hast made him most blessed forever. Thou hast made him exceedingly glad with thy countenance. For the king trusteth in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. In other words, he is in a place where he cannot be moved, and he is in the presence of God. We see something similar in Enoch's experience. If you remember in Moses 7, Enoch describes this experience. We read, It came to pass that I turned and I went up to the mount, and as I stood upon the mount, I beheld the heavens opened, and I was clothed upon with glory. And I saw the Lord, and he stood before my face, and he talked with me, even as a man talketh with another face to face. This is the experience at the end, where the king is given clothing, and he's also, notice, given a promise of invulnerability. Look at verse 8. Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. Verse 10, their fruit shalt thou destroy from the earth and their seed from among the children of men. For they intended evil against thee. They imagine a mischievous device. Verse 12, therefore shalt thou make them turn their back when thou shalt make thine arrows upon thy strings against the face of them. Be thou exalted, Lord, in thine own strength. So we will sing and praise thy power. So think about this. If the king is before the Lord, I think ritually we would say he's like the brother of Jared. He stands before the veil or Moses as he's at the top of the mount. He meets God, not as prevented. I th- like I said, I think verse 3 is a horrible translation. He's been crowned, he's been dressed, and he's been given promise of invulnerability. Victorious over all of his enemies that tried to stop him and destroy him. Exactly. I mean, for those of you that have been to sacred places, the, the, these are powerful promises. So 21 is powerful stuff. This is the king being given these promises. But remember, these promises also extend to us as well. So let's go to the 22nd Psalm. Would you agree, Bryce? Psalm 22 is probably the gem. Yeah. If you have limited time this week, make sure you allot more time for 22 than the others. This is the gem of all of the ones we're going to study this week, because it's a look into Gethsemane. One of my favorite authors, Frederick Farrar, when he describes Gethsemane, said the following, We may not intrude too closely into this scene. It is shrouded in a halo and a mystery into which no footstep may penetrate. And yet there are invitations to come in and see a little bit. Psalm 22 is one of those. We get to walk into the heart of the Savior as he wrestles in Gethsemane. And so we start off right off the bat with a very familiar phrase, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel." I think that's a glimpse into the wrestle inside of the Savior's heart in that dark moment. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And yet, I know this is right, and I trust, and I'm going to see this through, and I just sense that wrestle within him. It also is a link to exactly what we talked about in the book of Job. It's that same wrestle with the challenges that we face in our life, and where is God, and my need to go through these, but I still trust Him. So it's that beautiful wrestle, and we'd seen it in the New Testament where He says, now is my soul troubled, but what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. There's that tension between where are you, God? Why are you not helping me and strengthening me? Why am I doing this alone? And I know that this is the right thing, and I'm going to trust him, and I'm going to see this through. In C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters, which is a book about a mentor devil trying to coach an apprentice devil, he says the following, Our cause is never more in danger than when a human, no more desiring but still intending to do God's will, looks upon a universe from which every trace of God seems to have vanished, asks why he has been forsaken, And still 
obeys. I think that's a beautiful moment in Gethsemane that we need to talk about, that Jesus looked around and saw no trace of the Father. He was completely abandoned, and yet he continued. He saw it through. He could have ended it at any moment, and he didn't. And that wrestle is such a beautiful look into the Savior's heart, and one of the reasons I love Psalm 22 so much. Verse 2, I did cry in the daytime, but thou hearest me not, and in the night season, and I'm not silent. He cries out during the day and at night, and now he's crucified at day. But what happened at night? And this is where the Latter-day Saint doctrine of what happened in Gethsemane really shines forward, where we know that in Gethsemane it was night and he cried out. What I find fascinating, Bryce, about Psalm 22 is I see this in the setting that it came in anciently, that the king was surrounded by his enemies and ritually slain, but this was all pointing their hearts to the day when the king would die, when the king would have his garments parted, as Psalm 22 indicates. And early Christians would read Psalm 22 to Jews, and they would kind of have these debates. One of them is Trypho, who's a Jew, and another who's a Christian, his name is Justin. And we have what's called the dialogue with Trypho, where Justin goes back and forth with Trypho and uses the scriptures to justify that the only rational belief is in Christ. And he uses Psalm 22 in part of his arguments. And we quote some of this stuff for you if you're interested. But in Justin's mind, he basically told his friend, he said, How can you read Psalm 22 and not see Jesus? And so as I read this, I see Jesus all throughout. Look at verse 6. It says, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. That may seem troubling. What does this have to do with anything? I think in one way we could see this as the Savior descended below all things. DNC 88 verse 6 Another way we can look at this, and early Christians debated this, but they said, well, Jesus isn't a man. Jesus is the Son of God, and so it fits that way. The word for worm kind of has a dual meaning in the sense that it describes the animal that was used to make scarlet thread. Sean Hopkins kind of gets into this idea that describing themselves as a worm could do with suffering, the great suffering due to sins. It also ties into the book of Job, where Job's suffering reportedly is due to his sins, and he was treated as the lowest of creatures as a worm, if you go to Job 25 and it talks about this, but also that the word worm in Hebrew is a variant name for the creature used to provide the color scarlet in the ancient world. Only royalty or the very wealthiest people could afford the dye from this worm, and scarlet became identified with Christ's kingly authority and wealth. The soldiers at Christ's crucifixion, for example, placed upon him a robe of scarlet to mock him as king of the Jews. The coloring for this robe would have come from that individual creature. And so there's some wordplay happening there. But I think that verse 6 overall is talking about that he has descended below all. And then we get to verses 7 and 8, which is a reference to the moment on the cross when people were mocking him. Now, Jesus says seven statements from the cross. I love those seven statements. They are so indicative of the Savior and his personality. But then one day I realized the most profound thing about the statements from the cross was something he didn't say. And that changed my life. In Psalm 22, verses 7 and 8, it says, All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. And there really were several moments like that. For example, in Luke chapter 23, you've got this moment in verses 35 through 37. And the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them, deriding him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen one of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. Now, you can't convince me that there isn't a natural desire inside of us to show those people up. 
and to have lightning come down and strike them or to come off the cross or to do something majestic to prove that you are who you claim to be and that their ridicule of you is wrong. And yet Jesus said nothing to them. In that moment where he could so powerfully have convinced them that he was the Son of God, he was not after the show. He was simply after pleasing the Father. I think this is a beautiful moment looking into the heart of the Savior. It kind of goes back to that early moment when he began his ministry and the devil took him up to the temple and said, if you're the Christ, jump off because the angels have promised to save you. And had that been me, I know that in my heart, I would have had some desire to prove myself right and Satan wrong. And yet Jesus doesn't have that desire. How many times in our life have we felt compelled to silence the ridiculing mob instead of just being about our Father's business? And that's one of the things I love about those two verses is what he didn't say from the cross, what he didn't do when he was being derided and mocked and ridiculed. He did not bite back. Maybe this is one aspect of heeding them not that are in the building. I am going to stay focused on the tree. And that's what Jesus did, and he was true to it. He didn't have to prove himself to anyone else. He was simply after his Father's glory. That's good. Now, verse 12, many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. This could tie to the mythological warfare between the angels that rebelled in heaven and the general who is Christ, Christ the great war general, battling against the headquarters of the evil forces. If you remember, we talked about this with Genesis 6, that Bashan was this mythological backdrop to the angels that rebelled in heaven. And it's interesting, that's right around the environs of Galilee where Jesus was living his life. In other words, he chose to live his life up in Galilee at the place where the enemy built their headquarters. We must remember that the giant Og, if you remember, we talked about this earlier in the Old Testament, the king of Bashan back in Deuteronomy 3, he represents the mythological headquarters of the region of hell and the forces of darkness. And so I do see this, that the many bulls have compassed me and that it mentions the strong bulls of Bashan. I think the author of Psalm 22 sees this big cosmic battle between these two forces. Whenever I read that in verse 12 and other places, it reminds me of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe where the demons rise up against Aslan and they're just rejoicing when Aslan dies. And so Bryce, who's Aslan? He is the symbol of Christ. I mean, there it is. Whenever I read this, I remember reading that book as a child and not having read the Bible all the way through. And then later in my life, reading the Bible, and it dawned on me that C.S. Lewis knew his scripture. And so what do they do? They gape upon me with their mouths. And then it says in verse 14, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. I see this as a prediction of the Savior's posture on the cross, putting his bones out of joint. Elder James E. Talmadge talked about this, where he said that when Christ died, that this event on the cross signaled to him, at least, that Jesus had died of a broken heart. And I I see that as a possibility here, that the Son of God is completely poured out like water, completely out of joint. And then his tongue cleaveth to his jaws. Remember how he cried out on the cross when he was thirsty. And then we get to verse 16. We're back to this, the dogs surround him. But then we get to a fascinating phrase in verse 16, where his hands and his feet are pierced. Now, I know there's some controversy in scholarship about, does it really say pierced? Because that is a pretty clear reference to Jesus being the Messiah. And some people would push back on that. But I'm going to take the text exactly as it says, that they pierced his hands and his feet. And that becomes a major symbol throughout all of the scriptures of Jesus and who he is and what he did for us. Remember when he gets to the Nephites, the one identifying mark that he chose to retain in an otherwise perfected, resurrected body was the pierce marks in his hands and in his feet. They symbolize something. They symbolize something to all of us, and they represent that he was victorious, that he did take my wounds, 
and that I can be okay because of him. I'm simply going to read this stunning statement from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. He said, when we stagger or stumble, he is there to steady and strengthen us. In the end, he is there to save us. And for all this, he gave his life. However dim our days may seem, they have been a lot darker for the Savior of the world. As a reminder of those days, Jesus has chosen, even in a resurrected, otherwise perfected body, to retain for the benefit of his disciples the wounds in his hands and in his feet and in his side. Signs, if you will, that painful things happen even to the pure and the perfect. Signs, if you will, that pain in this world is not evidence that God doesn't love you. Signs, if you will, that problems pass and happiness can be ours. These wounds are the principal way we are to recognize Him when He comes. He may invite us forward as He invited others to see and to feel those marks. If not before, then surely at that time. We will remember with Isaiah that it was for us that a God was despised and rejected, that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. I cannot tell you how much I look forward to feeling those wounds in his hands. I was so moved at age 16 when Elder Bruce R. McConkie, moments away from death, said, In a coming day, I shall feel the nail marks in his hands and in his feet. But I shall not know any better then than I know now that he is God's Almighty Son. It is powerful to think what those pierced hands mean to all of us. It is a beacon of hope. His pierced hands are a beacon of hope that my pierced hands, the wounds I have taken in his service, will be acceptable to him and healed. That's good. After they pierce his hands, verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. He cries out for help in the 19th verse and cries out for deliverance from, quote, the power of the dog. Then, from Psalm 22, verse 22 to the end, I read this as the Savior's work in the post-mortal spirit world. This is, the suffering is now over, and now we've shifted gears. And I think this is beautiful. And I think if we read this, we take that, we talked about that magnifying glass and we're pulling it over the pieces. If we understand that the Savior had a post-mortal ministry, and if we read section 138 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and we read all these passages that talk about the God of Israel coming to those that are in the dust and declaring their deliverance, and we'll see some of this when we get into Isaiah, I think Psalm 22 Verse 22 to the end is beautiful, and I think it really is. It really becomes clear. And we see this also with the Book of Mormon saints. When the Nephites wait after the darkness, the Savior comes. Look what it says in verse 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will praise thee. This is the Savior declaring deliverance. This is also the Father declaring the name of his Son unto us. Behold my beloved son, and we praise him. And so what does verse 23 say? O ye seed of Jacob, praise him, all the seed of Israel. And then notice verse 26. Part of the ceremony of the early temple was the eating of the bread and drinking. That was part of the service. We see this in 3 Nephi where Jesus several times feeds them. We today do the sacrament outside of the temple, but know that that was part of the experience. And so verse 26 says, the meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord, they that seek him, and your heart shall live forever. But notice it's not just to Israel. Verse 27, all ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. If that isn't section 138, I mean, I don't know what is. Section 138, this is where Joseph F. Smith has 
the vision that the gospel will be preached to all those in the spirit world, and the Lord organizes his messengers on one side of the veil to send those that know the truth into the places to declare the name of the Lord. In other words, that's verse 22, to declare thy name unto my brethren. Why? Because verse 28, the kingdom is the Lord's. And then in case you missed it, look at verse 29, all they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. That phrase, to go down to the dust, means to die. We're talking about those that have died. And then it says, a seed shall serve him. Now, that's a really rough translation. There are variant texts that say, my seed shall serve him. And what's interesting is Robert Alter even calls this out. He says a better translation is, my seed shall serve him. And if we think about who are the seed of the Lord, now we're into Abinadi, where Abinadi says, Those that love the Lord, that listen to the prophets, those are his seed. And then when we get to Isaiah, Isaiah says, when his soul has been made an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. And so verse 31 concludes, they shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he has done this. And so I love the end of Psalm 22. It's hard for me sometimes to read some of the difficult passages about the suffering of the Lord, but we have to acknowledge it. We have to talk about it. It's part of the atonement. But I'm grateful that Psalm 22 doesn't end in verse 21. Every single time we talk about the suffering of the Savior, that conclusion is like Lehi's conclusion. In 2 Nephi chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, where he talks about he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin, he answers the ends of the law, then he says, and here's the end of Psalm 22, how great the importance to make these things known unto the inhabitants of the earth that they may know that there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah, who layeth down his life according to the flesh, and taketh it again by the power of the Spirit, that he may bring to pass the resurrection of the dead, being the first that should rise. Every time we talk about his pain and his agony, it should rush us. It should compel us to move forward and proclaim what he did. I love in Isaiah chapter 6, where the angel takes a piece of the atonement from the altar and presses it on Isaiah's lips and is purged, and then immediately the question is asked, whom shall we send? Who shall go for us? And the idea is we study the sacrifice of the Savior so that we understand what he did for us and feel compelled to go tell everyone on earth what he did for us. Powerful message. So there's more here than we can do in this podcast. And I'm with Bryce. This is really worth going through slowly. Sean Hopkins has done a lot of work on Psalm 22. So if you're more interested in some of these details, we put significant commentary from Sean Hopkins as it relates to Psalm 22 in the show notes for you. So next, I think that most people probably know bits of the 23rd Psalm. In fact, it's even been made into music. Many, many different artists have used, especially verse four, but I really like what Baker and Ricks assert. They assert that the 23rd Psalm shows the plan of salvation in the pattern of a three-act play. They write, quote, While the 23rd Psalm is very short, it is remarkably complete. Its surface text is almost universally acknowledged to be one of the most beautiful poems ever written. Its subtext is awesome. The subtext is not hidden. It is only not apparent to those who do not know its sacred language. It is a short play divided into three acts. Act number one is the premortal existence. And then the second part is the valley of the shadow of death. And then finally, the third act is I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so at least the way they divide it out, they say in verses one and two, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. This all has to do with the first act. We're in the Garden of Eden, as it were, as Adam and Eve, or we're in the presence of God. But then we descend. Verse four, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now we're into the space of mortality in the place where death, thorns and thistles, darkness reigns, a very difficult space. But we're not alone. Verse four says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. 
the rod is a symbol of kingship. It is the same as the royal scepter that is the branch of the tree of life. And remember, the tree of life is the love of God. And the love of God is made manifest. Bryce has talked about this a lot when we did the vision back in 1 Nephi 8 and 11, how the tree of life is the love of God. And the iron rod, which comes from the tree, is a manifestation of the love of God. And so the the Lord is always, in all cultures, and all languages, trying to teach truth to people after the manner of their language, according to their understanding. And so whatever your religious background, or even those that don't have religion, God is always trying to speak to us, whether it's through prophets or poets or people who write great plays, musicians, any way God can, he's going to teach us this. And so I think even though we're in the valley of the shadow of death, this rod or this staff that comes from the tree is an extension of God. Now, for those of you that are Latter-day Saints, I would say that the rod is an extension of And on one end of the rod, remember, this is dream imagery in 1 Nephi 8, that rod, that the iron rod, a lot of times in our artwork, we turn it into a railing. It kind of looks like a standard railing, but it's not called the iron railing. It's called the iron rod. And so think of the king sitting on the throne in the Holy of Holies, and he's holding out, extending his rod. And once again, as it is dream imagery, that rod extends through the mist of darkness. And so when you pick up the Book of Mormon and you read it, you're asking for that light. You are grabbing onto that rod. And so in essence, you are connected to the divine, the sacred divine. And so the Lord can administer comfort. Another way to read that word comfort is to be empowered. And this is really tied into all the promises that are given to the king, where he's washed and anointed and clothed and crowned and given a new name. We're going to see all this stuff in the Psalms. This has to do with the comfort that is given to them as they follow this path. And so what happens? Verse five, the head of the individual is anointed with oil. And then finally, in the final act, they dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So it is a beautiful three act play, but there's a lot of interesting terms that are used that are tied to the temple and tied to priesthood and tied to coming into God's presence. And I really see some of the the stuff that Nephi sees in his vision, whether it's the rod or notice the valley of the shadow of death. What would the equivalent of that be in Nephi's vision? That You could probably say that would be the mist of darkness. And so you see some interesting connections that I think are provocative and invite us to ponder. Now, speaking of that three-act play, I love changing the tenses of these verbs and how it applies to each act. I can imagine there was some nervousness in premortal life to come down to earth. I know we all shouted for joy at the opportunity, but when the reality of coming to earth hit us, we must have been nervous. But this is what we must have said to ourselves. Now, I'm just going to change the verbs here and notice how much comfort it would give a premortal spirit facing the daunting task of going into mortality. The Lord is my shepherd. I will not want. He will make me lie down in green pastures. He will lead me before stilled waters. He will restore my soul. He will lead me in the paths of righteousness. And even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear because he'll be with me. His rod and his staff, they'll comfort me. He'll prepare a table before mine enemies. He'll anoint my head. Do you see how much comfort that must have given a premortal spirit, knowing that Jesus was going to be there all along the way? Now, let me read it again for someone kind of in the depths of mortality and struggling with the challenges of mortality. They're going to say the same words, but they're going to say, the Lord is my shepherd. I won't want. And he will make me lie down in green pastures. Now, notice the promises often in the future. I know it's coming. He will lead me beside the still waters. He will restore my soul. I know that. He will lead me in paths of righteousness. And even though right now I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I am not going to be afraid because I know that he will be with me. Notice how much comfort that gives to someone in the challenge of mortality. Now, let me read it a third time. When I get to the other side, when I realize how much he has done for me, For those of you who are C.S. Lewis fans, do you remember that scene in The Horse and His Boy where Shasta has been sent on to warn the king? 
and he's lamenting how tough his life is, and then he realizes that there's a lion walking next to him. And then as they talk, they realize that it's Aslan, and he's been there all along. He was the one that has helped him from the very beginning. I believe that when I cross the veil and I look back on my life and see the Lord's hand in my life, I will say the following, the Lord is my shepherd. And because of that, I didn't want. He made me lie down in green pastures. He led me beside still waters. I see it now. He restored my soul. He led me in paths of righteousness. I didn't realize it at the time, but now I can see it. And when I walked to the valley of the shadow of death, I didn't fear because he was with me. His rod, his staff, they comforted me. He did prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. He anointed my head. I think you could read that psalm three very different ways. A premortal spirit facing the daunting task of going to earth, a mortal soul struggling with the demands of mortality, and an exalted soul looking back on his life, and every single one of them, the common thread behind them all is that Jesus was, is, and will be with me. That's why I love Psalm 23. I like the way you break down the different readings. I think that adds depth. So now we jump to Psalm 24. It's a beautiful one, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord. And I think for me, Psalm 24 is help in those moments where I don't know if I'm going to make it. I know there's this notion that I'm never going to be good enough. I'm never going to make it. And so Psalm 24 kind of just jumps out in that sense that in this temple drama, as you're struggling with the concept, can I really make it into the Father's presence? Now, I know you can take it too far, but the question is, who's going to make it? And the answer is the people who trust in Jesus. Those are the ones who are going to make it. You don't have to be perfect, but he's going to be perfect. So many times we get so overwhelmed with my inability to be perfect that we don't focus on his ability to save me. He says in verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, for he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. God's in charge. So then the question is, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And the answer isn't, he that was perfect. Notice the wording here. It wasn't those who kept every commandment and never broke anything. Who shall stand in the holy place? The people who were cleansed. You don't have to be perfect, but you do have to be clean. And you need a cleaner. And that's what I love about this. Who shall ascend? Who's going to make it into heaven? Who can be king? Someone who got their hands cleaned. Not someone who lived a perfect life. It's someone who was cleaned. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity and sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of salvation. It's that vision that Joseph F. Smith had where he gets to the house and it says bathe and and then he meets his father and his father says, you're late. And he says, I know, but I'm clean. And I think that's the idea is I can make it. If Jesus will cleanse me, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to make it. That's what I love about Psalm 24. That's what resonates with my soul. I like that. I'm going to nerd out just briefly on Psalm 24. This could be read as the ascent of the king and the priests as they come with the ark to ascend up the temple mount, come through the gates. And there are a series of questions and answers regarding who can come in. And the answer is those that have clean hands and a pure heart. But what we have here at the end is the king of glory who's come back from battle and he is put on the throne. Now, the king would ritually do this 
But remember, the king represents the God of glory. And so it's this idea that when the ark comes into the temple in this procession and it's put into the Holy of Holies, and it we think actually sat in this little niche in the rock that was the foundation of the Holy of Holies, when that happened, it was a symbol of God's presence with them. And so the gates would lift, the king of glory would come in, and this is a great procession celebrating God's kingship over the forces of chaos. And remember, as he becomes king, the extension is that we can become like him. So interesting stuff there in the 24th Psalm. The 25th Psalm is an acrostic. There's nine acrostics in the book of Psalms. Probably doesn't matter to most normal people. But what that means is that each verse kind of starts with a different letter in the alphabet. Now, there's a couple letters skipped in 25, but this is the one of nine acrostics in the book of Psalms. Okay, so next, 25 through 28, I, I kind of titled this in the show notes, David pleads with the Lord. And I just kind of picked parts of each Psalm where David pleads with the Lord. And so if you're interested, go to the show notes. To me, 25 through 28 are interesting, but I don't think they hold a candle to some of the other Psalms as far as depth and meaning. Yep. I'm going to withhold until we get to Psalm 51, because that's where I want to talk about David's pleading. And since that's next week, we'll save that for next week. Okay. 29, the 29th Psalm. There's a lot of disagreement in Psalm 29 as to its origin. There are strong arguments that the 29th Psalm come from another culture outside of Israel, the Canaanite culture. There's a a lot of discussion and scholarship on what to do with the 29th Psalm, that perhaps it's borrowed. I'm totally okay if it is, and I think the debate will go on as long as there are scholars and there's texts until we have further light and knowledge. I just think we don't know. But just know that this Psalm does kind of fit into that state of a hymn to Baal in the Canaanite religion or a hymn to the Lord. And what we're praising him for is his victory over chaos. Notice what it says. Verse 3, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. Now, remember the waters as a symbol for chaos. And so what does God do? He splits them. He splits the cedars. He splits the chaos. Even in verse 7, he divides the flames of fire and shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. His voice is so powerful, verse 9, that he can make the hinds calve. And what does he do in verse 10? He sits upon the flood. The Lord sitteth king forever. Now, remember the cosmology of the ancient Near East. Over this dome over the earth, the Rakia, there were this group of waters. And so heaven was actually above the waters. In fact, the word water, Mayim, is even in Shamayim, the word for heaven. And so the idea was that the heavens were actually made of fire and water. The, the word esh is fire, and that's the sh sound that we get in the front of the Mayim. Shamayim is the, the heavens. And so we have fire and water. And so what do we have here? God is greater than flames of fire. He sits upon the floods. And so it's definitely ancient Near Eastern cosmology. I really like Psalm 29, but if I was teaching a gospel doctrine lesson, I probably wouldn't spend my time there. I'd spend my time in 22, but it's really cool. Like the majesty of God is great. And then we get to Psalms 30 through 33, which I'm just going to group these as Psalms of thanks and praise. So then we get to Psalm 40 and Psalm 40 starts with this phrase, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Now, I think there's a missing phrase here, and the phrase would be, for the feet of those who are in the east shall be established. We'll we'll talk more about that as we go through the Psalms. But notice that the feet of this individual being established upon the rock is a promise of what is called sacral kingship, or to be a sacred king. The east is the place where the righteous dwell. So this reference to the individual's feet being established is a reminder of the time when the king sat upon the throne of God in the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant is that footstool. And this promise is also in Isaiah. It's a promise of sacred kingship. And we read this in the 40th Psalm, where his feet are set upon a rock. We see this also in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, 
And in the Sermon on the Mount, at the conclusion, as the individual approaches the Holy of Holies, he's warned about wolves in sheep's clothing and warned about true and false messengers and told that if he's wise, he will build his house upon a rock. And that's kind of this same idea, that the individual who is, verse 1, waited patiently, is now brought up out of the pit and has had his feet established on the rock. Now, this is also Christ. He is the rock. And Christ, in his resurrected state, is that sacred king with his feet established on a rock. Now, look at verse 11. Withhold not thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. In many of these psalms of pleading, the individual is pleading for the tender mercies. That's the rechem and the loving kindness. That's the hesed of the Lord. That word rechem is tied to the idea of womb. It's literally like, that's what the word means. And chesed is this loving kindness of God. Over and over again in these Psalms, this image of God as someone who has tender mercies, which is tied into the idea of a womb. And I love how the the image of a mother that gives birth is a description of who God is with his love for us. And this chesed, this deep and abiding love. This is part in the 40th Psalm this king or whoever this individual is, because like I said, I think this is fitting with the end of the drama. Verse one says, I waited patiently, and then his or her feet are set up on the rock. And then notice what the individual says in verse nine, I have preached righteousness in the congregation, and I haven't refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. Verse 10, I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. In other words, because I've stood as a witness, verse 11, I will be wrapped up in the love of God. And I see this as a very beautiful and sacred temple image. And then it ends with verse 13, that the Lord will deliver me and make haste to help me. So I love Psalm 40. And I think a lot of Psalm 40 is tied into the final promises that God has given to those that love him and that serve him. And looking back on their lives, recognizing the blessings that have come into their life because of him. I think that's what verse 5 is all about. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. Now, Psalm 40 has a phrase that just, back to the tuning fork image, it just resonates to the depths of my soul. One of the great blessings that following Christ brings into your life is mentioned in verse 3. He hath put a new song in my mouth. And there's so much depth here. Let me just see if I can be brief. But he hath put a new song. If you follow that phrase throughout the scriptures, a new song, you're going to find it surprisingly everywhere. When the Israelites come out of Egypt, when they're freed from bondage, do you remember they sung a new song? It was the song of Moses. It was a praise of having been conquered. In the book of Revelation, you're going to find that phrase a lot, that the saved in the end sing this new song. And then there's this curious idea in Revelation 14, verse 3, these are the saved that are on Mount Zion, the people who made it through mortality and they've been saved. Verse 3, they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the Lord. Now go back to Psalm. He put the song in my mouth. And Revelation says no one could learn the song. And I have a theory. The reason you can't just go out and academically learn the song, I can show you the words to the song that we will all sing when Jesus comes. In section 84, starting in verse 98, it talks about we will sing together this new song. And then in verses 99 through 101, there are the words to the song. But just because the words are printed in the Doctrine and Covenants doesn't mean you'll know the song. So turning to the Book of Mormon, I think Alma gives us the name of the song. Alma chapter 5, verse 26, he says, If you have experienced a change of heart and have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, I would ask, can you feel so now? That's how you learn the song. You have experienced a change of heart so that you feel to sing the song of redeeming love. When you feel that he has redeemed you, and yet you're coming out of bondage like in Moses' day, 
you will know the song. He will put the song in your mouth because you will feel to sing the song of redeeming love. I love that the Book of Mormon shows us a man learning the song of redeeming love. In Alma chapter 36, Alma tells his experience to his son, and he talks about walking through sin and being racked with torment and harrowed up to the greatest degree. He says something fascinating. In that setting, he says, the very thought of coming into the presence of God did rack my soul with inexpressible horror. Remember that. The thought of facing God filled him with inexpressible horror, but then the atonement comes into his life. O Jesus, thou Son of God, have mercy upon me. And here comes the cleansing of the Savior. And then he does see God. In verse 22, it says, Methought I saw, even as our father Lehi saw, God sitting upon his throne. Now, do you remember a few verses earlier, he just said that the thought of facing God filled him with inexpressible horror. But then after being cleansed, he sees God. Now, what's the emotion in his heart? Verse 22, I saw God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising their God, and my soul did long to be there. Do you see what happened? He learned the song of redeeming love, and he longed to praise God. And so I love that in Psalm 40, that he hath put a new song in my mouth. I have felt to sing the song of redeeming love. Looking back on my life, one of the great moments is that he was there for me and that I know that song. And sometimes I need to remember, like Alma says, can you feel so now? But I know that song. So that leads us to just one more tuning fork moment. I love in Psalm 46, I hear myself saying this in those moments where I am scared or I'm in the dark, where I'm in the valley of the shadow of death. I quote to myself Psalm 46. First, I sing to myself a child's prayer. Heavenly Father, are you really there? And do you hear and answer every child's prayer? And then I quote Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. When we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, knowing that his rod is there, we need to hear the Lord say to us, be still and know that I am God. Wherever you are in this journey, to those who are beginning it and are facing a daunting task ahead of you, be still and know that he will be your rod and your scepter, and your crown, and he will plant your feet on the rock. If you are in the middle of the valley of the shadow of death, hear him say, be still, and know that I am God. All of those blessings are coming. And if you have reached the end of the journey and you can look back and say, yep, you need to hear him say, thank you for being still. I was always with you. And with that, we'll come to a close of this podcast. Thank you for being with us. We look forward to spending time with you next week when we cover Psalms 49 through 86. Make it a great week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions. (laughs) 